Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. John Chen from the Department of ENT of Queen Elizabeth Hospital of Hong Kong. Thirteen years ago, my boss referred a lady to me to have otoplasty. I told him that I have no experience on otoplasty. He said he will coach me. He saw once during his training in the United Kingdoms. He taught me the open autoplasty technique. I'm always grateful to him. When I read about the techniques for autoplasty, I got lost in the jungle of innovative procedures for autoplasty. How come such a small peanut generates so many different procedures and papers? Is it too much for the pinner? I have no financial conflict of interest to disclose. The aims of autoplasty for the patient and the surgeon are alike. That is, to obtain a natural looking, not eye catching, non tender ear. To have the surgery with the fewest complications and the best long-term results. And the ultimate goal is that the patient is happy about the outcome and you are proud of the surgery. A 50 years old healthcare assistant in our hospital consulted us to have autoplasty for her because she was distressed by her grandfather saying that a person with bilateral back ears is a prodigal, a disgrace to the family. Since her childhood, she had to hide the ears with the hairs and hacks. Will you help her? I tried to help her. An autoplasty was done in 2011 with the incisionless autoplasty approach. This is the photo one week post op. She was very grateful. A typical open autoplasty is the master date procedure. The wide incision and the undermining of the skin and subcutaneous tissues create a dead space with the potential for hematoma, abscess formation, and perichondritis. Excision of skin excessively on the posterior pinna can lead to tenting, bridging of the skin and the postauricular sulcus. Considerable postoperative bandaging and maintenance efforts are required to achieve good result. The incisionless autoplasty was developed by Professor Michael Fisch of the Indiana University. From a desire to achieve excellent cosmetic effects was a limitation of complications. This surgical approach uses a new method of placing autoplasty retention sutures percutaneously. It completely removes the need for incision, wide tissue undermining and skin excision. The first paper was published in 1995 in Laryngoscope. He called it the version 1.0. The second paper was published in 2004, added the percutaneous scoring technique to break the pinna cartilage spring memory. He called it version 2.0. In 2009, he published a paper to address the correction of conchal bow and the lobule. He called it 
the incisionless otoplasty version 3.0. We understand that the whole surgical journey begins before the surgery itself. We have to make sure the patient is physically and psychologically prepared and fit for the surgery. He understands the pros and cons of otoplasty. The special instruments needed are the three old white braid polyester fiber sutures on reverse cutting needle, a fine single prong skin hook to bury the knot, a 21 gauge phrenotomy needle to break the cartilage spring line memory, and a 30 gauge needle on a trabeculin syringe for injection of local anesthetic with vasoconstrictive. The surgery can be done under GA in children and LA or GA in adult. Prophylactic antibiotics and steroid are used. non distorting amount of local anesthetic with vasoconstrictive to branch the penis skin. If deemed necessary, the conco bow and the ear lobule should be corrected before the creation of the neo antihelix. The first step of the procedure is manually bending the pinna to create the neo antihelix and then to break the cartilage spring line memory by scoring with a 21 gauge phrenotomy needle percutaneously and render the ear malleable at the neo antihelix. In 1963, Jet Master Day published a paper to explain how to use the matcha suture to correct the prominent ears. He utilized an open approach to apply the suture. The concept of the incisionless otoplasty is the percutaneous placement of Mater Dei suture without the prosauricular skin incision undermining and excision. The best entry point is the medial surface. Medial surface at the medial, medial superior corner, point A. This allows the suture knot to be buried deeply under the thicker skin. The needle is inserted at point A through the cartilage and exit at the anterior pinna. The needle is regressed and re-enter through exactly the same exit hole. The needle is then pushed subcutaneously, superficial to the perichondrium and exited at the anterior surface of point B. The needle is regressed and is placed through exactly the same exit hole and is pushed through the cartilage and exited at point B at the posterior surface. This completed the first short limb of the retention suture. The needle is regressed and placed through exactly the same exit hole and is pushed subcutaneously, but superficial to the posterior perichondrium. Okay. Okay. 
to exit at point C. This completed the first long limb of the retention suture. The needle is then regressed and pushed through completely through the same exit hole and penetrate the whole thickness of the pinna to exit at the anterior surface of point C. And then the needle is regressed and pushed through the same exit hole subcutaneously, but superficial to the anterior perichondrium to exit at the anterior surface of point D. And then the needle is regressed and and we enter again through the same exit hole and through penetrate the whole thickness of the pinna to exit at the posterior surface of pinna point D. And then from point D, the needle we enter again through the, exactly the same exit hole and was pushed subcutaneously, but superficial to the posterior perichondrium to point A. And then from point A, it completed the retention suture. After a series of retention sutures are completed, slow progressive tightening lowers the ear profile to the desired position. Knots are then tied. A single crown skin hook pulls on the soft tissue adjacent to the suture knot. This action buries the knot below the skin surface and allows it to rest on the cartilage as a final position. The point to note is the needle must re-enter exactly through the same exit hole. If the re-entry of the needle next to the exit hole, it will pull skin subcutaneously and cause incursion cyst formation and dimpling of the skin. Also, the suture may it may be exposed and result in chronic infection. In 2009, Professor Michael Fisch published a version 3.0 of the incisionless otoplasty procedure. The retention sutures are placed only from the posterior surface of the pinna. And unlike the version 1.0 or 2.0, the needle never emerges through the anterior surface to further reduce the trauma to the pinna skin. The incisionless technique can be used in creating the neo antihelix. It can be used for correcting conchal bone and the ear lobule too. You may read it out. Post-operatively, mastoidectomy time dressing can be used for the first night. Bacitracine ointment application, water precaution, and oral antibiotic are for a week. Experienced surgeons are well aware that the small operation needs considerably more respect and care than may at first be apparent, and autoplasty techniques exemplify this. The complication profile of the incisionless autoplasty is very promising. The most reported complication is the suture uh, breakage, or the suture extrusion, which is comparable to the open technique. The hematoma 
infection are rarely reported. Last year, the patient came back to ask me to restore her pinna to the original appearance. After 10 years of surgery, she suffers from headache and depression. She suspects it's caused by the surgery. How to help her? Thank you. You're welcome to raise questions. <laughs>